Good evening and thanks for staying tuned. Welcome to our COVID-19 update program. I am Ladi Akiri Dulwale. Here are the highlights for this hour. Minister of Health Osage Hanere tells healthcare workers without necessary training not to treat COVID-19 patients. DG of the NCDC asks lawmakers to engage all stakeholders before passing the proposed Control of Infectious Diseases Bill. And more than 3 billion people have now contracted the COVID-19 virus around the world. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation and Chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, Mr. Boss Mustafa, says no country is ready to ease up on the lockdown, but that such decisions need to be made in order not to compromise the health of the country's economy. Speaking during the daily national briefing of the Task Force on COVID-19 in Abuja today, he says that it is a collective responsibility to ensure that all curb the spread of the infectious disease, with individuals playing their part by taking to advisories from the authorities. Country is ready. Look at all the countries. It's a balance, it's a very, very delicate balance that leaders in different countries take. It's really a difficult terrain. And I, I just I just don't envy the leaders when they receive reports and recommendations. I don't want to imagine what is going on in their heads because this is a choice of life and death. And a balance of that deserves a lot of, uh, how do I put it, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of resolve by the leader to do good for his people. So the choice that we have taken is to balance the health and also the wealth of the people in such a way that we do not further compromise the health of the people. The truth about it is that most countries take one step at a time. And that is what we are doing. We cannot tell you what would happen in the next couple of weeks because that is the nature of the novel virus. It's unpredictable. You don't know how you might be learning about it now in a different context and a different way. And the dynamics will change. And if you are not prepared to adjust quickly, you might be confronted with a very catastrophic uh, situation. So for now, this is the choice that we have made. And that is why I always end up with a serious appeal to our people that is a collective choice and it's, this responsibility is collective. We must resolve to do what is needful to ensure that we do not escalate the spread of the virus. Secretary to the Government of the Federation and Chairman of the COVID-19 Presidential Task Force, Boss Mustafa. Health workers have been asked to treat all patients fairly, but with stringent measures to reduce patient to healthcare worker infections. Health Minister Osage Ehanere explains that this measure needs to be enforced as data has shown that the bulk of the number of COVID-19 infected doctors are from private hospitals. There are not so many people in the health sector who are infected. The uh, latest figures we have is that there are about 113, actually. And these 113 are not all public health workers. There are some for a good number from private hospitals. And if you hear us speaking here frequently against uh, trying to treat coronavirus in private clinics, we're actually referring to people who do so without having necessary precautions, without having necessary training, because they risk infecting themselves and they go home and give this infection to their family, and uh, that is not the right thing. So the healthcare workers who uh, have no training, have no business actually handling coronavirus. I once again call on, health, call on all health workers 
to stringently follow laid down standard infection prevention and control measures at all times and not to take any risks. We cannot afford to lose the service of essential manpower at this time. Every client coming to your facility should be treated with respect, but with a high index of suspicion for COVID-19. But still, treat every client with fairness so that persons suffering from other ailments do not suffer neglect or treatment refusal. It is not ethical to turn clients away without at least giving them a medical advice. Neither should a person in distress be refused care in an emergency situation. The advisory on case management is accessible online. The Director General of the National Center for Disease Control, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazu, has been reacting to the Control of Infectious Diseases Bill, which has passed a second reading in the House of Representatives. Dr. Ihekwazu says that there is the need to involve those in the field for consultations to have a perfect bill that will suit the purpose for which it is required. The bill sponsored by the Speaker of the House, Femi Bachabiamila, is seeking to empower the NCDC to be more proactive in carrying out its mandate, even as it is a body with great professionals. The members of the House of Reps, uh, everybody is concerned about the situation and where we found ourselves in. And I think they are doing their very best to come up with solutions. The solutions, the only solutions that they can come up with are new laws. So um, I take it positively that they are doing something. Of course, the bill requires more consultation. Um, I am personally not in favor of uh, drafting a bill in the, mid, in the middle of a crisis. I, I think we need to get over the crisis, get our heads around what has happened, and use the momentum to um, engage with all stakeholders to come up with a bill that will really serve this country for now, but serve it into, well into the future. Uh, this will, the new, whatever new legislation we come up for public health and infectious diseases in Nigeria, will be so important because there has never been a time that the, the importance of this has been more clear in the consciousness of Nigerians. So we must think through each step carefully and come up with a bill that is really fit for purpose and serves us now but also serves us well into the future. As we focus tonight on curbing community transmission and understanding the awareness of COVID-19 in Nigeria, let's do a quick comparison of the figures recorded in the country from the 1st of April to the 29th of April. As of April the 1st, there were 174 total confirmed cases. Of the 174 cases, 93 of them, that's 52%, had travel history to high-risk countries. 18 of them, that's 10%, were contacts of known confirmed cases. And 63, that is 36%, have incomplete epidemiological information, that is, unknown source of infection. Still talking about April the 1st, two confirmed fatalities were recorded as of then, with the most affected age group being between 51 and 60. Let's fast forward to April the 29th. Between the first day of the month to the 29th, there was an increase of over 900% in the total of confirmed cases, bringing the figures to 1,728. Of this number, 210, that's 12%, had travel history. 444, that is 26%, were contacts of known confirmed cases. 868, that is 50%, are cases with no epidemiological link. And 206, that's 12%, had com incomplete information. The number of deaths now stands at 51. And the most affected age group is between 31 and 40, that is those who now form 23% of the total. Now, from Lekki area of Lagos, a public health physician, Dr. Doi Odubanjo, joins us to look at how to curb the spread of coronavirus as well as the issue of community transmission in a particular. Good evening, Dr. Odubanjo. Thank you for being with us at this time. Good evening. It's a pleasure being here. We've heard a lot about community spread and community transmission of this, but the question that many are asking is, 
Do the communities know anything about the transmission that is going on within them? What do you think? Well, I think increasingly so. Because the communities are beginning to know. Uh, especially one big question people ask is, what, what has the lockdown done for us? And I always say, for one, the lockdown means that people will ask questions. Why am I not being allowed to move? Why are things so laid back? Uh, why are policemen all over the place? And that in itself presents an opportunity to tell them what is going on if they had not heard it before. So I think um, to start with, uh, we, we have an increasing number of people who have come to know about the coronavirus, even if they can't pronounce the name, uh, but they know that there is a virus out there that uh, the government is trying to fight. But we need to do a lot more than we have done. Uh, we need to get down to the grassroots. We need to use every available structure. And I think a place like Lagos has good structures in place. Uh, Lagos is one of the states that has medical officers of health in all the local governments, for instance. So Lagos has a fairly strong primary health care um, in, in, in the state and a fairly strong system that can be exploited. The CDAs are there, community development associations uh, and all that. And all those structures should or rather must be used in order to enlighten the community. The big thing that must be said is that when you say community transmission, as the name implies, it is moving in the communities and the best way to fight is to get the communities to fight back. When we talk about this community transmission, uh, as you've pointed out, one of the gains that many have pointed to in this last almost four weeks now of the lockdown, particularly in the key areas where there seems to be a cluster or there are clusters of cases, is the fact that right. we were able to attack the virus spread in those communities because people remained where they are largely. With this yes. easing that is going to begin on Monday and all that will come with it, do you still think mm. that we will be able to keep up the momentum of those advantages we have secured when people are now able to move around uh, from 8 in the morning to 6, some others from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening and all of that? Will we still be able to do that? Well, not, not as much as under a lockdown, and that's why there was a lockdown. Uh, but the problem with the lockdown is that it's not sustainable on the long run, you know, for many reasons that are... Uh, quite well known. However, uh, once you begin to ease, and that's the term, you ease the lockdown, you don't remove the lockdown. And in easing the lockdown, I know that there have been statements, the governor gave a whole speech yesterday, uh, trying to detail things that must be in place, even though people are moving around, using face coverings or face masks, uh, ensuring that you still, uh, no gatherings, no social gatherings, no religious gatherings. And all of these things are still important. And it's important for people to know that all you are permitted to do is to be able to move, but move safely. You know, avoid the crowds, avoid uh, unhygienic uh, lifestyles and all of that. And it's important that we all adhere to it. And I would say it's also very important now that the law enforcement agents actually enforce those things. Last point you've made is where I would like to wrap this uh, discussion up. Enforcement. It does appear as if, and uh, the SGF was asked that yesterday, that the absence of penalties... Uh, well, stiff penalties for defaulters seems to have encouraged quite a lot of people to break uh, many of these restrictions, even when the lockdown was quote and unquote total. What stops them now from uh, uh, what stops them from not complying now that they're going to be allowed some measure of uh, movement? And what kind of risk does that pose uh, to the curbing of the community transmission that we're talking about? Well, I, I beg to differ from the SGF in my view of why that enforcement wasn't very or totally effective. Uh, and my view is that it, that was happening because the law enforcement agents themselves uh, do not fully understand the implications of not enforcing the things that they are asked to enforce. You know, so I, I believe that we need to start from there uh, to engender the patriotism needed in the law enforcement agents. What you don't want is the harassment of citizens and all of that. I actually believe that when you come to enforcement, is your last card and is actually an admission of failure. 
in terms of public enlightenment and behavioral change management. So once you have to push enforcement to its limit, it means you failed in the other things. Uh, but you'll be more successful once you can get the law enforcement agents and particularly get the communities themselves to understand the implications of what they do or don't do, uh, in which case you won't need so much of enforcement. So I think it's more important that we educate the law enforcement agents and educate the communities themselves so that people really do these things uh, and not so much about the punishment meted out to them. Oh, uh, Dubanjo, for joining us at this time uh, from uh, Lekki in Lagos. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Less than 24 hours after the Kano state government expressed the fear of an imminent danger of community transmission, 24 positive cases and two COVID-19 related deaths have again been confirmed uh, in Kano State. Uh, this brings the total number of positive cases there to 139 and a total of five deaths recorded. Speaking during an interaction with the presidential task force team, Governor Ganduje says the pandemic is fighting the state more than the way the state is fighting uh, the outbreak. All right, from there we go to Abuja, the federal capital uh, territory, where uh, our correspondent uh, Kayla Megua has a uh, report where basically it's talking about it is one thing to accuse people of not abiding by the rules surrounding individual responsibility in the wake of the novel coronavirus, and another thing entirely to educate them uh, on this uh, rule. disregard for social distancing and other preventive measures against COVID-19 in Pape, a suburb of the nation's capital, got us wondering just how much education is out there about this virus. Our search took us to a rural community in Asokoro called Paduma Village. As with most rural areas, infrastructure is at an all-time low here. Poor roads and no electricity. There are new structures springing up in Paduma, which means job opportunities for the villagers. How educated are these villagers on protecting themselves from COVID-19? Actually, we were told to always uh, wash our hands with uh, flushing water. Whatever we are doing, whichever work we are doing. After and uh, before and after the work, we wash our hands and then keep distance from others. Patricia Aldo was born here and lives here with her extended family. <laughs> Dinner tonight is a pot of soup with no meat or oil. Adhering to the lockdown order has been hard for her, as she depends on daily pay from menial jobs to survive. We will never get water. Mm. Okay, this thing, this thing, they call and say, wait till I just, I just go, wait till mm -hmm. wash hand like, clean hand like this, and eat. When person do like this, nothing will happen, because the thing is bitter. And if anybody come outside for the place so that they will no know know the person, no near the person, give a uh, distance with the person. Now what did they talk about? So like me now. Yeah. I'm not gonna pick on me and you. Know? No. <laughs> I'm not agree. <laughs> you cannot go wrong. <laughs> a lot of villagers here were asked to join other villages for community testing. And they're doing what they can to stay safe. Like in the house, I have a kid. Anybody that comes to my house, you wash your hands. And as you come here, I give you sanitizer before you carry my kids. Some education has been done here in Paduma, albeit informally. But they need some essentials like face masks, soaps, hand sanitizers, and even gloves to implement what they have learned. I go for and go for firewood, no firewood. They also need palliatives to survive this period. If these people are not considered the poorest of the poor, then who are the poorest of the poor? After the break, we'll talk to Kayla about what she saw and possibly what could be missing uh, as, the, as we, the battle against community transmission uh, goes on. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Uh, welcome back to our COVID-19 update. 
Our correspondent, Kayla McGuire, is in our Abuja studio. Uh, Kayla, good evening, and uh, seeing you, I trust that you are keeping us safe. Good evening, laddie. We are doing everything we can to stay safe at this particular point in time. You went to this outlying suburbs uh, of the Federal Capital Territory, which is one of the epicenters of uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus, to talk about, to talk to them about how much they knew of this potential community transmission, of course, which is now ongoing. Your general impression about the level of awareness, is it high? So we, we picked uh, Paduma village because um, it's a very massive village. There's over 7,000 people in Paduma, and they have phases. There's phase one, two, three. It's a very massive place. Now, when community testing was done in that, in one of those areas, the village that we went to today was asked to join the other village for community testing. So that was the reason why we decided to go there, because before the community testing, uh, before the community testing begins, they actually do a teaching. At least we saw that in Mabushi. They take time to talk talk to the villagers about you know, the dangers of the disease, how to protect themselves before they actually start the testing. So that was how I went to Paduma village. It was refreshing, I have to say, to hear them know so much. The first thing that happened, Ladi, was when I got there, they wouldn't come near me. That was the first thing that happened. Uh, I tried to make a joke with the woman there. I was like, let me come into the house now, you know, because it had happened to us at uh, the Kuchingo IDP camp. When we got there, they refused to come near us. They were social distancing and, you know, adhering to the rules in the IDP camp. And the same thing played out in the village today. So I tried to see if the woman would let me into her house, and she wouldn't. She said, no, I had to stand outside, you know, asked me if I wanted to eat some of the, of the soup. They'll get me a plate outside. She didn't want me anywhere near the house. So I started asking questions, and they knew quite a bit. And here's the thing about the things that they've been taught in this, uh, in Paduma village especially. Uh, they are given alternatives. So they don't have a lot of uh, the basic amenities that we enjoy, like electricity and things like that. So, you know, they taught them you can use ash to clean your hand. You know, try to, you know, uh, give them, you know, solutions that are in line with the realities that they face there. So my impression basically about the teaching that has gone on there, it's not bad, but more needs to be done. Like we said in that report, it, they've taught them a lot of things and a lot of ways to prevent themselves, but they need the basic amenities to be able to enforce the things that they've learned. So you told people to social distance, yes? So they're social distancing, but they need face masks. They didn't have any face masks, if you can see from that report. Everyone was walking around barefaced. Uh, they need soaps. They need uh, hand sanitizers. They didn't have any hand sanitizers in any of the houses. In fact, the people who bought hand sanitizers said they got it for 1,500. One particular villager was telling us how he felt the hand sanitizers that they bought were fake because they were too, uh, they were too watery and whatnot. So some of the things to help them, you know, prevent themselves from catching this disease. So they have the knowledge, but some of the materials that are needed, soaps, hand sanitizers, uh, gloves, you know, um, and, and, and all these other kinds of things to help them stay safe. Those are things that they need. And they need palliatives in these places because many of those people who live in Paduma Village especially depend on what they work on every day to feed. Thank you indeed, uh, Kayla. Uh, very comprehensive. Not too far from what would probably be the situation in several areas uh, with the same demographics. Thank you so much for your reporting and do stay safe out there. From uh, Kela in the Federal Capital Territory, let's go to our correspondent in uh, Lagos, Olu Phillips, joins us now uh, on uh, VAS uh, Streambox, I believe it is. Okay, Olu, where exactly are you? Uh, Ladi, good to hear your voice again this evening. We are back on the streets. Uh, somewhere we've located ourselves, somewhere around Okiafa, low, low, Lagos State, low cost housing estate, somewhere in the solo, uh, just after Okiafa. Uh, We're just at the inside or the entrance to the estate uh, because this place um, has a lot of activity uh, to stay and ask people what exactly is going on, Ladi. What can they tell you? I mean, we're talking about this community transmission and uh, what the communities know about it. So what have they been telling you that they know about this? Is, are they very well informed? And more importantly, are they observing what they have been informed about? Ladi, 
uh, incidentally, unfortunately, and painfully so, the community people or people who live in the most communities that we've asked tonight do not seem to understand the gravity of what we are talking about. And when I spoke to some of them, the excuses are very simple. One, we've had the numbers rise from 10, 20, 30, 50, to the hundreds, to the 200s, to the 300s, to the 500s, and to the 1000s. They said to me, we have not seen anybody who has been treated, who has been discharged, or who has um, actually uh, is been treated as it were. And so how do we really believe that this is happening? And I said to them, I said, listen, whether you like it or not, Corona and COVID-19, as it were, is very real, and we are having a law of community infection and community transmission. And they said to me, well, uh, we, we believe in Corona, yeah, but hey, come on, we don't know how it's going to be transmitted, let alone knowing the fact that they don't even know the fact that the Lagos State government, for instance, has set up testing areas where you can actually walk in and be tested and know for sure your status. And that was the part of the conversation that really broke my heart. Ladi. Olu, thank you so very much uh, for your reporting there from Okiafa area of Isolo uh, here in the nation's uh, commercial capital correspondent, Olu Phillips. The website of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, DNCD, has just that kind of information on the response to COVID-19 situation, particularly community transmission across Nigeria. It also has the most recent figures uh, showing that 307 patients have been discharged after testing negative to COVID-19. The death toll is now 51, and with the highest number of daily cases recorded yesterday at 196, the total number of confirmed cases in the country stands at 1,728. The state-by-state -state breakdown shows that Lagos has 931 cases, the FCT 174, Kano 139, Gombe 64, Borno 59, Ogun 50, Katsina 40, Edo 37, Oshon 34, Kaduna 32, Boji 29, Sokoto 27, Oyo 21, Akwaibum 12, Kwara 11, Ekiti Undo and Taraba have 8, Delta, Rivers and Jigawa 7 each, Zamfara 4, Inugu 3, Niger, Abia, Adamawa and Eboi have 2 each, while Anambra and uh, Benue, Plato, Imo, Bayelsa, Kebi, Nasarawa and Yobe states have one each. Now, the figures are quite startling if you take a look at this curbing transmission, the community transmission uh, in particular. We've taken those figures earlier on. Let me just go straight and introduce uh, the president or the chairman of the Association of Public Health Physicians of Nigeria, Dr. Tulu Olufunlayo. Thank you so much once again for coming in. Thank you. Thank the you. figures are scary. I mean, if you take the comparison between April 1 and 29, 900% increase. Yes. And this is the time we are easing up a bit. Virtually every state in the Federation, I believe, as at this morning, there was only one state that hadn't uh, received a confirmed COVID case now. Uh, do you think we will be able to sustain any momentum we may have gained from the last four weeks or thereabouts of the lockdown when we ease the, the lockdown and allow people to move around? Thank you very much. Um, there are several things to be considered right now. Really, we are in a very tricky and precarious situation because um, being a developing country with a lot of people below the poverty line, daily earners and so on, all these um, factors that we have listed over and over again, it's difficult to keep the country in lockdown for a long period of time. Besides, when the lockdown first occurred, there were quite a number of challenges. We didn't start testing large numbers on time, so we didn't get a very true picture of what we had early enough. Um, secondly, palliatives that were distributed initially were not getting to the most vulnerable. So a lot of people have been groaning and wailing. And while the truth is that, I mean, the fact is that really um, right now we are just beginning to see a steep rise in the curve, um, the government may have decided to do this now because they're also thinking of the health of the economy. 
Um, so the point really is that no matter when we decide to ease the lockdown, what is important is for us to be able to balance um, public health measures that will sustain social distancing, okay, with um, issues that pertain to the economy. And also the um, gradual easing shouldn't be rushed. If it is rushed, then any mistakes that are made will not be easily reversed. So we should look at it very carefully. We have decided this is the way we're going now. We need to really look at, we don't want a situation where on Monday in the nation's commercial capital, for example, you have the streets filled with cars and then people are not even able to get home. So we should have only a few, I mean, a small proportion of workers back on the roads. And those should be the most essential. So I think it really needs to be well thought out if and implemented if we are going to be able to maintain the balance. And I must say that definitely there will still be an increase in cases because when you let people out, no matter how few, you know, there's going to be some um, contact. But it's important how we manage that. And we could do a good job if we put our minds to it and put all the structures and machinery that are available deployed. The most vulnerable group, the case, uh, the, the, the group with the most infections, has moved from the 51 to 60 group at the start of April to the 31 to 40 group. Does that surprise you, one? Does it give you any element of fear, particularly considering the fact that the 51 to 60 group are but a very small percentage of the numbers you'll be talking about in the 31 to 40 group? Well, um, there could be several reasons for that. Remember that the um, demographics, the, the, the characteristics of the, the infection are changing. When we started, we had a large, of course, we started with travel history. Then we went on to the contacts or local transmission we could identify. At this point in time, 50% of all confirmed cases have no epidemiological link which means that it's most likely that they contacted it from other sources, from you know, the community. So we can't link it to anybody. So now we are leaving the very high risk to groups that we consider to be slightly lower risk. But remember that these groups are the more mobile groups than the elderly. So this may be one of the gains, in a sense, of the lockdown. Because during the lockdown, we seriously emphasized that the elderly were vulnerable, and, that they shouldn't and they, move. they shouldn't move, they should protect themselves. So maybe some ambitious or very, um, you know, energetic younger people are the ones now going out and contracting it. So these may be some of the reasons that explain the change in the age group that is now most preponderantly affected. If we take a look at it going forward and we look at, as you said, we just seem to now be ascending the curve. Uh, some of the countries that have ascended that curve say they are reaching the, the peak uh, and that after now it can only go down. In our case, we are just getting onto that. And I'm, I want to go back to the issue that you mentioned earlier, which is the balance between the health of the citizenry and the health of the economy. If there are active citizens who are healthy, then the economy can go on. But if there aren't, then of course the economy will still suffer regardless of whether or not it is open. What are we to do now? Particularly because the other group that is now seemingly affected are health workers. Uh, it was startling to hear the uh, health minister admit that no, it wasn't 300 health workers who were affected, but it was 113. 113 out of a number that is already inadequate is quite uh, uh, important. What are we to do now that people are going to move around more freely and therefore there might be more cases? What are we going to do so that they don't get swamped? Or you don't get swamped since you're one of them? Yes. Really, um, there are so many. We, one, we have to have a responsive system. The health system, the system at large has to be responsive, which means we have to keep on looking at the data and we have to keep on making adjustments as we see need. 
Um, of course, secondly, I had already said that we need to manage the easing of the lockdown very carefully. We must strengthen our public health measures. And like was said um, by your correspondent in Abuja, you can see that if we engage the communities, they can actually understand what we're talking about. But I don't think enough has been done. We need to use all structures available to us to reach out to our communities and let them understand what this infection is about so that they can take ownership. The NCDC has this campaign, hashtag take responsibility. Every individual needs to take that responsibility and say, no, I don't want to go close to somebody else, or I don't want to go out if it's not absolutely necessary, and so on and so forth. I must, you know, maintain hand hygiene. So these things are very, very important. And then we're looking at, you know, um, the capacity we have for admissions. It's being discussed that, you know, we might be looking at different strategies for... Yes, because the NCDC surprisingly talked about Lagos in particular. Oh, yes. Having a struggle with beds Yes, now. definitely. Because we're, we're 931 almost... cases, I mean, if you subtract those who have been discharged, that's still quite a number, about 700. Yes. Uh, that means active cases are being treated now. That's quite a lot. The, the Honorable Commissioner for Health, I remember in a briefing, I think at the weekend, did say that we are almost at the, you know, top... Um, we've almost filled the capacity that we have in the state. So we also need to be thinking about different strategies for managing cases of COVID-19 going forward. And I remember that the NCDC boss did allude to that today in his speech that we're still trying to manage and look for space, but we would also think of other means so that we don't get to a situation where we get overwhelmed. But I must say, health workers' welfare must be quickly looked into. Generally speaking, um, personal protective equipment are still not readily available. And we know why. They're not available worldwide. But we need to get them. We need to devise means. We also need to streamline our operations in the various facilities so that we do not have people being unduly exposed. I must tell you that some of our health workers that got exposed to COVID-19 got exposed to doing active case surveillance, not just treating patients in the hospitals. So the exposure is everywhere. And, you know, we just need to ensure that we get to have the minimum requirements whenever we see a patient. Because every patient right now is suspected COVID until proven otherwise. Going forward, we've, we've talked about, you've talked about how this needs to be carefully managed. It's broken down currently into six weeks, two, two weeks, uh, three week tran uh, tranches. Uh, and then at the end, of, uh, the end of the period, of each period, a review is done. If you were to mention three things that they, they should be looking out for at the end of the first two weeks, what would those be? Well, definitely the increase in the number of confirmed cases, the increase in the number of deaths, and, of course, the number of testings that are being done. Like I said earlier, we must really ramp up testings, especially in places where hitherto testing was a problem because those could just be, um, you know, a can of worms waiting to explode. So we need, if we know what is going on, we have an idea of the transmission in each area, we can deploy strategies to mitigate transmission. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Tolu uh, Olufunlayo, thank you so much for your time. Dr. Olufunlayo is the president uh, or the chairman of the Association of Public Health Physicians of Nigeria. Maybe they'll change that title in because of this uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Over 200 violators of the lockdown order have been convicted by the police in Niger State. Let's have this and more from the North Central Zone from our correspondent, Emperor Simon. The latest update we've received from the Niger State Task Force on COVID-19 is that it has concluded contact tracing of 75 persons who have had contact with both the first and second index cases in the state. And out of the 75 persons that have been traced, the government says they are all good to go. However, we know that 62 persons were quarantined at the state quarantine center. And the government says that out of the 62 persons, 54 persons have been discharged, while eight are still being examined. Now, in terms of the lockdown, we've also received report from the 
police in Niger State that they have been able to convict 204 persons for various violations of the COVID-19 2020 order by the state government. Now, their offenses range from carrying passengers beyond the prescribed number, moving about during lockdown order, as well as not wearing face masks, among other things. Now, away from Niger State, we look at what other states are doing within the North Central region. Benue State is collaborating with the NCDC for the establishment of uh, an infectious center that would not only cater for COVID-19, but also diseases like Lassa, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS. Now, the project is expected to go up the sum of 36 million naira, and already Benue State has paid its counterpart fund of 20 million naira. This is a good news for the North Central region, considering the fact that at the moment, only Plateau State has a testing center in the region. These are some of the updates that we have from Niger State and North Central region. From Mina, Emperor Simon. Thank you, uh, Emperor, uh, reporting from Mina. We'll take a break at this point. When we come back, we'll go beyond our shores and take a look at what's happening in some parts of the world. Thanks for staying tuned. The World Health Organization has been speaking about ways countries uh, can tame or curtail the spread of COVID-19 in West and Central Africa. According to the WHO's Regional Director for Africa, Dr. Machiditsu Motsi, the spread of the virus is a big concern as the continent battles with armed conflict, hunger, displacement, as well as natural disasters. The spread of the virus in Western Central Africa is a big concern. Millions of people are already struggling to survive the devastation of armed conflict, of hunger, of displacement, and also of natural disasters. COVID-19 is at the doorstep of some of the world's most vulnerable populations. Countries are working on public health measures which will remain central at every stage in the response to this pandemic. These measures are surveillance and finding cases, identifying those who are infected, testing, isolation of those who are infected to stop transmission to others, tracing their contacts quickly so that they too can be quarantined and isolated to prevent onward transmission from them. Now, more than 3 million people worldwide have contracted the coronavirus with more than 200,000 dead from the disease. The health crisis is taking a huge toll on the global economy. The U.S. and Eurozone economies have shrunk by 4.8 and 3.8 percent, respectively. In spite of the health crisis, the world is filled with mixed tales of dealing with the impact. Indeed, economies around the world are struggling to cope with the impacts of the pandemic. Germany's Labour Office says the country is going through the biggest recession since its founding in 1949, claiming this is worse than ever and more comprehensive than ever. The country's unemployment rate has increased by 308,000 to more than 2.6 million. He says it's never happened before. Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitostakis today outlined plans to support the economy, grappling with the fallout from the pandemic. The country is still recovering from an almost decade-long financial crisis. It exited a third international bailout in 2018, but a nationwide lockdown imposed to stem COVID-19 has turned expectations for a strong growth upside down, as it now projects a deep 5 to 10 percent recession this year. Meanwhile, around the world, people are finding new normals amidst lockdowns. Residents of Moscow are venturing out to the streets and taking rides by cars and public transport, despite a lockdown that remains in place until May 11. Queues have increased at food banks in Spain since the outbreak began. 
The number of families requiring food donations has increased from approximately 450 to 700 families every month as people lose their jobs and are unable to access government benefits. The daily death toll from the pandemic has fallen to its lowest tally in the country in nearly six weeks. But there are also successes. In China, health officials say the number of imported COVID-19 cases on Wednesday fell to the lowest in 35 days, and about two-thirds of patients have been discharged from hospital after recovery. And on a brighter note, what it feels like to be 100. Many of us do not know yet, but Walter Reed is a survivor of the coronavirus pandemic gripping the world currently, and he turned 100 as well. He is also a World War II veteran turning 100 years old on Wednesday, April the 29th. And so to celebrate all his feats, birthdays, and survival, the South Shore Rehabilitation and Nursing Center on New York's Long Island organized a celebration for Mr. Reed. Staff joined him on the center steps as a caravan of police cars, fire trucks, motorcycles, and other well-wishers rode by to chair for him. How many passengers inside the, uh, the bus you, you enter from Lagos? About 12. passengers. How much do you pay from uh, Lagos State to Adwekiti? Around, in total, let me just say, close to 12,000. 12,000 error. Where the, where, tell me the, the exact location that the bus dropped you. And finally tonight, remember the video we showed you yesterday of the Akiti father who bluntly refused to take his son to arrive from Lagos where Abe Okuta are home to his residence in Ado Akiti. The Akiti state governor, Dr. Kaede Faimi, has appointed him a COVID-19 response ambassador in the state. The man identified as Mr. Adeoye, a former road safety officer, insisted he did not want to take chances while allowing his son into his house because he might have been infected. Governor Fahimi revealed Mr. Adiri's appointment in a tweet today, stating that he represents the kind of self-discipline, selflessness, and sense of collective responsibility that Ikiti State and Nigeria needs desperately today to progress. And would like to know what you are doing to help fight the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. You may have heard of the Senegalese who made the $1 testing kit or the Nigerian technicians who repaired ventilators in Joss Plata State. You may not be as technical or, in fact, as medical as either of these two, but we'd love to know all about what you are doing to curb the COVID-19 pandemic. Do send us your videos or pictures to any of the social media platforms right there uh, on your screen. Thank you for being with us. I'm Ladi Akri Duluali. Tomorrow we're back with another update at 12 and another at 6, and then we'll be here at 9. Good evening.